Hello, I'm Rachel from Dwensa Garden in Ireland, but today we're a long way from Ireland. This is the second video in my series on Moroccan gardens. And today we're going to visit some of the most beautiful examples of traditional Islamic gardens and explore the concept of the Moroccan Riyadh. So do join me. Welcome to this garden tour video of traditional Moroccan gardens. Today we'll visit a variety of gardens in Marrakesh from the large to the small and explore the many uses of the traditional Riyadh. The Riyadh is a courtyard garden built in the middle of the buildings but open to the air. We'll spend substantial time in the Jardin Sucre, which is a reconstruction of a large 19th century Riyadh. But there are so many different Riyadhs in Marrakesh, many of them repurposed as museums, restaurants and hotels, that we'll get the chance to see a whole range. Marrakesh in North Africa is famed for its gardens. This rich heritage comes from a tradition that stems right back to the Islamic garden. The Riyadh is a Moroccan interpretation of the Islamic garden. This type of garden became particularly successful and common in Marrakesh because of a combination of factors which include the city's climate, availability of space and the desire of the city's wealthy for mansions and palaces. The Islamic garden typically is a rectangular courtyard garden that's symmetrically divided into four parts along its central axis and has a fountain in the middle. This design stems from Persia and the Sharbag. Sharbag in Persian means four gardens and describes the quadrilateral layout of four smaller garden sections divided by walkways or flowing water. This layout is based on the four gardens of paradise mentioned in the Quran. One variation has sunken quadrants with planted trees filling them so that they're at eye level with the viewer. Another variation is a courtyard at the centre intersection with pools surrounding the courtyard. The irregular flow of water and the angles of sunlight were the primary tools used to create a mysterious experience in the garden. Fountains, usually found at the centre of gardens, were used to represent paradise and were most commonly octagonal. The octagonal shape is geometrically inclusive of a square and a circle. In this octagonal design, the square is representative of the earth, while the circle represents heaven. Therefore, the geometric design represents the gates of heaven, the transition between earth and above. The colour green was also a very prominent tool in this religious symbolism, as green is the colour of Islam, and a majority of the foliage, aside from the flowers, expressed this colour. Islam emerged in the desert and the thirst and gratitude for water are embedded in it. In the Quran, rivers are the primary constituents of paradise and references to rain and fountains abound. Water is used as a way to refresh, cleanse and cool an exhausted visitor and gardens were historically used to provide respite from a hot and arid environment. Arabic and Persian literature reflect how people historically interacted with Islamic gardens. The garden, as a worldly embodiment of paradise, provides the space for poets to contemplate the nature and beauty of life. Water was an integral part of the garden and served many sensory functions, causing the animation of still objects the addition of sound to the stillness of a wall garden and providing illusory reflections of plants and the surrounding buildings. As we mentioned before, gardens were built to the interior of a building and were often used to convey a sense of the power and wealth of the owner. Reflective pools were strategically placed to reflect the building structures connecting the exterior and interior spaces. So you may be wondering how did Marrakesh, an essentially desert city, support so many fertile gardens and water features? 
In the latter half of the 11th century, the ancient Persian hydraulic system of the Khanat or Katera was built in Marrakesh. This was used to funnel water underground from the nearby Atlas Mountains to the city. This system of water supply allows water to be transported over long distances in hot dry climates without loss of much of the water to evaporation. The system has the advantage of being resistant to natural disasters such as earthquakes and floods and to deliberate destruction in war. It also doesn't rely on rainfall, delivering a flow with only gradual variations from wet to dry years. In Marrakesh, the Khanat or Katera distributed water to the city's mosques, hammams, those are the baths, fountains and some of the great houses. The Riyadh, which is now the Jardin Sucre, for example, was supplied by this system and we can still see the vestiges of the Riyadh's original water system made up of pipes, reservoirs and canals cleverly linked together. Irrigation and fertile soil were used to support a botanical variety which couldn't otherwise exist in Marrakesh's dry climate. Unfortunately, there are few surviving records that tell us which plants were grown traditionally in Islamic gardens. But we do know that there were cherries, peaches, apricots, almonds, oranges, quince, jackfruit, date palm and even apples. Other plants included hollyhocks, pineapples, hibiscus, hyacinth, iris, oleander, lotus, jasmine, roses, narcissi, violets and lilies. Nowadays, we still see some of these plants in the riads of Marrakesh, although there have been many modern additions. We are spending some time today in Riyadh Lucrisi, now known as the Secret Garden or Jardin Sucre, so I thought you might enjoy some information on this garden's colourful history. The origins of the complex date right back to the Sadian dynasty, which was in the second half of the 16th century. The ruined complex was then rebuilt in the mid 19th century by an influential Qaid or tribal chief of the Atlas Mountains. His name was Al Hajj Abdallah Ubihi, and when he rebuilt, he fully respected the original layout of the Sadian era complex. However, the Sultan of the time didn't trust the tribal chief Ubihi, as he believed he was trying to gain too much power. So the Sultan had the tribal chief killed by placing poison in his tea. The property then passed into the possession of the Qadi Moulay Mustafa, an important judge who enjoyed close relations with the ruling family. After that, it fell into the possession of the former head of Marrakesh's Watchmakers Guild. His name was Al Haji Muhammad Lucrisi, and he lived in this beautiful Riyadh until his death in 1934. The property then ceased to be maintained properly and soon fell into a state of disrepair. Finally, in 2008, the idea of restoring the building complex and opening it to the public took root, and today it is open to the public. The buildings in the Jardin Sucre today are characterised by the presence of tadalact, or Moroccan plaster, applied on brick and rammed earth walls. There is use of zelija tile, which is a variety of glazed terracotta tile handmade in Fez. There's inlaid cedar wood, hand carved stuccos and geometric designs made by master decorators to showcase the outstanding skills of the local craftsmen. The intricacy of the work is quite incredible. If you're in Marrakesh, don't miss a visit to this beautiful garden. It can be tricky to find as it's in the souk, the covered market of Marrakesh, and GPS just doesn't work very well in there. The souk really is a maze. When you finally get to the garden and step inside, you'll have two large garden spaces to explore. The first is planted up with plants from many corners of the earth and is very interesting.
second space, however, is maintained along the traditional Islamic garden lines and more emulates the original Riyadh in planting. Here, there's quite an overpowering smell of onions. This comes from the use of tulbagia, or society garlic, in mass plantings in the quadrilateral sections of the garden. Tulbagia and grasses are the prominent plants here with use of various trees, including olive. There are pots of scented herbs dotted around the place, including pelagonium. The space is very peaceful and graceful, although the pervasive smell is definitely a bit quirky. I leave you with one final piece of wisdom that comes to us from the world of Islamic gardens. It's the royal prescription. In ancient times, headaches and fever among royalty were given the royal prescription. Patients were advised to remain in cool areas surrounded by plants with cooling effects, such as sandalwood and camphor trees. I bet this is good advice for many a headache, even nowadays. And now we've come to the end of this video on traditional Moroccan gardens, and I do hope you've enjoyed it. If so, consider subscribing to the channel so you won't miss any of my content. On Thursday next week, you can expect my final video on Moroccan gardens, when I'll be bringing you an unusual and beautiful sculptural garden just outside of Marrakesh. The Anima garden is very different from the traditional Islamic garden or Riyadh, much more modern, and I absolutely loved it, so do join me. In the meantime, expect a short video as usual on Sunday. This time it's the last in my mini series on late flowering perennials and we'll be looking at beautiful golden flowered ones. Thank you so much for joining me on this garden journey and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.